Hello everyone, I'm Jim Bayless. Uh, this is Physics 120. Uh, I'll be discussing some things you'll see in some, some other videos, uh, hopefully that I'll be doing. Uh, sometimes I'll be taking it a little higher, a higher level than even Physics 120. Maybe some Physics 209 material will get put in there because it's also mechanics and it's got a calculus base to it. Some of you have a calculus basis, uh, so it's good for your personal enrichment. If you don't have a calculus basis, and, and I go into the calculus a little bit, don't worry about it. Uh, just worry about knowing Physics 120. Uh, that's it, it's just there for you. Uh, I'll tell you the stuff you need to know for sure. If I ever go into calculus, I'll be telling you, don't worry about it, it's just your personal enrichment. All right, this is from the survey book, survey and Buell, it's called the survey book, 11th edition. I will start with chapter one a little bit and talk about problems five, 23, 44, and 54. Uh, another thing to look at, I have a, a very, very great amount of material presented to you on Canvas and fully solved problems. So all of these problems, are, or very many of these problems, are fully solved for you on Canvas as well. So you don't have to worry about me being uh, the live presentation also. You can also look at it uh, as it's presented to you on Canvas. That's going to happen across the board for all the classes I teach. Uh, whether it's Physics 120, 122, 209, or 210, I try to have a lot of problems uh, fully solved for people uh, online on Canvas. So, looking at problem number five, uh, from, it's, it's called, it's, it's, I call it chapter one, like it's, almost, it's almost like a misnomer, I guess you could say, they, they call them topics. Chapter one or topic one doesn't really amount to a whole beach, guys. I think it's some of the other stuff I do have it as, uh, I do have this chapter, but it's topic one, chapter one, it's understood. The topics are what the chapters are. So for topic one, problem number five, uh, they're saying Newton's law of universal gravitation is presented, is represented by F equals G, capital M small m over R squared, where capital F is the gravitational force Big M and small m are masses, and small r is a length. Force has the SI units G times M over S squared. What are the SI units of the proportionality constant G? Okay, this is kind of easier, easier done than said, I guess you could say. We'll see that a lot uh, with mathematics if you play it right. Uh, we're talking about, they're giving us this. Mass, mass, there's a constant G. R is distance, and we have this. Uh, this is force in newtons. Uh, you're going to find that one newton is a one kilogram mass moving with an acceleration or experiencing an acceleration of one meter per second per second. So one kilogram times one meter per second per second is the newton. Uh, so force is newtons. This breaks it down a little more organically, I guess you could say, a little more specifically as to what it is. This is the shorthand. The newtons, one kilogram times one meter per second per second. Given this right here, they want to know what the proportionality constant would be on it. Uh, there's a number of ways to do this. Uh, what I I showed in the notes a little differently than what I'm going to show right here. What do you say to solve for capital G as is? Multiply by r squared on each side and divide by the product, capital M, small m, uh, after you've done that. You've got g is equal to, uh, then we've got f r squared, multiply by r squared on each side, divided by this product right here. Well, okay, uh, as far as I get 20 little units, I mean, that's, this is, uh, there's a lot here, but as far as talking about the units are concerned, Everybody's got to be in agreement here somehow. Uh, this is newtons, which is equal to this. Uh, these are meters. This is kilograms, this is kilograms. Let's see where it goes. I guess one way you could do it, there's, there's a number of ways you could kind of look at it, uh, and that's this. You could say, uh, let, let, let's, let me do this, then let me show you, let me show you something else as well. Uh, one kilogram, times one meter per second per second. That's the force units. 
I put actually a, a number, the number one here, but it could be the number 100 right here, a number 10 million right here, and then be a different, a different amount of, of newtons. This is meters squared, and this is kilograms. This is kilograms. You don't need to put the one there. The big thing here is what kind of units are you talking about? When this thing kicks around a little bit, the unit is going to be something. And I'm not saying how big it is, you're saying just get a ballpark idea what the units are. Well, we can see here this kilogram and this kilogram go. Uh, this is meters, this is meters squared, so that's meters to the third. This is that. So let's see what we got here. We got uh, meters to the third. Let me just make sure we got this out of the mark here. It's pretty good. And um, second squared on the bottom. And what else we got here? Uh, we got the one kilo, we, I guess at the end of this, we got one kilogram here. So it's looking something along those lines, guys. So what we're saying is, what are the units here? G is going to have units uh, of the form meters cubed. I didn't say how many of those units it's going to be. I didn't tell you how big that unit. We call this G, the universal gravitational constant. I never told you. Never told you guys what the universal gravitational constant is going to be. I simply said, these are the units it's going to have. And there's other ways you could have gone with that. I mean, you could have said, um, you know, G is going to be along the lines of, you know, what, what's happening here. Well, you could say, the, the way it all played out here, this, this right here is units of mass. Uh, times units of length over time squared, that's force. This is units of length squared. And this is mass uh, squared occurring twice. If you kick that around a little bit, you got the mass occurring once right here. That, that goes. Uh, you got T squared down here. And you got L to the third. And that's really fully consistent, guys. That's fully consistent with this, where that's coming from. So that's it. Now I'm going to erase uh, a good amount here and then kind of take it further. So we did number five. Let's do 23, 44, and 54. So let's leave this here. Give us some, some kind of bearing of what we're doing. Uh, from the survey book. Uh, so let's take it. Let's take it from there. So let's look at 23. 23, uh, I'm in top of one. Uh, 23, a car is traveling at a speed of 38 meters per second on an interstate highway where the speed limit is 75 miles per hour. Is the driver exceeding the speed limit? Just by your answer. So, they are purposely, they are purposely asking, uh, you gotta, you got to have the savvy to make the correction. So, let's see what we got here. Basically, you know, 
Guys, and none of this, none, a lot of these solutions, you're going to see in, in the work I try to do with you guys, I try to emphasize something that I think is common sense, uh, but I don't know, maybe it's, it's not always obvious, you know. None of these solutions, how you do them is set in stone. The most important aspect in any sort of mathematics and physics that you do is a logical thought process. Make sure the logical thought process is there, make sure it makes sense to you, uh, and make sure you're getting the right answer. I'm not going to tell you how to get, the, I'll tell you as much as I can how to get the right answer, but I won't mandate how you get it. If you've got another way to do something and your mathematics is sound, is strong, go for it. Please do that. Uh, do what works for you. If you, you know, it's it's got to make sense to you. And I'll try to give you the suggestions that I can as well, obviously. Well, I'll tell you what, let's see what the, what the speed limit is and the whole thing here is. Uh, I think they're saying 75 miles per hour. Let's, you know, we either got to convert the meters per second. Um, you know, the person is traveling this fast. I can either convert the meters per second to miles per hour, or I can convert the miles per hour to meters per second, but there better be agreement. If we're exchanging money, I better know how much the currency that you're using, you better know the currency that I'm using, and then we can make comparisons to what's going on. So, for, uh, for 75 miles per hour, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. We know, well, it's not obvious, but 1,609 1, meters is equal to one mile. 1.609 kilometers is equal to one mile. There's ways you can look this up, there's ways you can derive this stuff. Uh, for our purposes right now, let's get the job done. Let's find out where we're at. We're staying at 75 miles per hour. 75 miles, 75 miles per hour, 75 miles is 75 miles each one of those 75 miles is 1.609 kilometers. Every kilometer is a thousand meters. An hour has got 60 minutes and every minute's got 60 seconds. This is where we're at. 75 miles per hour equals, okay, so I mean, you could have you, you gotten, you could have cut to the chase like right here. You could have got the 1609 already. The 1609 meters, 1609 meters equals one mile. So basically, every single mile is 1.609 kilometers. Every kilometer is 1,000 meters. This is the total number of meters traveled in this product number of seconds. So basically, at the end of the day, you guys, the way it's coming out is 75 miles, each one is 1,609 meters. Each one of those miles is 1,609 meters. And you're going to divide it by 3,600 seconds. Well, okay, if you want to be going at the speed limit, in the strictest sense, the fastest that you're going to be going is 33.52 meters per second. 33.52 meters per second is the fastest you're going to go. Uh, we were told that they are going that fast. Obviously, they are going beyond the speed limit. This thing right here This thing right here exceeds the speed limit. Simple as that. Okay. So there we go. Uh, we've got five done, we've got 23 done. Let's go to 44 and 54. Um, let's get an idea of where we're trying to go with all this stuff, guys. Uh, 
Uh, beyond that, let me just see here. Like I said, there's, there's a lot more problems, guys, <clears throat> that are fully solved on pencil and paper. Uh, this is what I'm trying to do kind of live, given the circumstances that have transpired in the world with the health crisis that's going on. So, uh, but the, there's going to be a lot more problems that you're going to find on campus. You're going to find problems that I've done from other books that I've given you the actual copies of the problems themselves for you to look at and then have the solutions for them as well. And I try to do that with all my classes, like I said, uh, whether it's 120, 122, uh, 209, or 210. So I'm trying to cover, uh, trying to cover everything, guys. Uh, certainly it's far from perfect, but I think you're, you're going to be in pretty good shape if you take a look at the stuff. Um, so let's look, let's keep going. Let's go to 44. Guys. Um, so for 44, you guys, uh, give, me, give me kind of an interesting, uh, it's an interesting problem. I, you, you might, this is one of those instances where you, you might have an easier time following my notes that I have printed out for you than what I'm going to show here. Uh, maybe not. I mean, we'll, we'll see how that, that all works out. But as I said, this is all going to be in the notes as well. And as much as I can do live, I'll try to do live. Overwhelming majority, a lot more, a lot more work is going to be in the notes you guys, that's for sure. Uh, not, not a video presentation, I guess you could say. For number 44, given points, R1, now they're, they're talking about polar coordinates here. So the given, um, uh, let me read it again and we'll kind of take it from there, I guess. Given points R1 theta 1 and R2 theta 2 in polar coordinates, Obtain a general formula for the distance between them. Simplify as much as possible using the identity cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. Write the expressions for the two points in Cartesian coordinates and substitute into the usual distance formula. Okay, there's a lot here to keep in mind, guys. The usual distance formula that you're talking about is if there's two points, here, here's a point, here's a point, distance between them is D, you're basically building a right triangle. If this guy right here is X1, Y1, and this one right here is X2, Y2, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. Uh, you know, I don't try to give you a good way to look at it. Uh, this is the distance between them. And So this would, this is x2, that's x1, x2 minus x1, or at least the absolute value of that quantity, is this distance right here. And right here, this is y2 minus y1. Right there. So guys, to, to, to kind of make a long story short, this guy right here, there's a lot to say here, and you know, the devil's always in the detail. x2 minus x1, y2 minus y1, you've got this for that guy, you've got this for that guy. You guys remember that c squared equals a squared plus b squared for the hypotenuse to find you know, the relation of the hypotenuse to the legs of a right triangle. Well, D becomes the C. A becomes this quantity squared. Even if it's negative, you square it's a positive answer. Square root both sides. This is the formula.
Yeah, that's the formula. Uh, okay, great. They didn't. They didn't, didn't really give us. Uh, they didn't give us x1 y1. They did not give us x1 y1, nor did they give us x2 y2. They gave us polar coordinates. So the way you want to kind of look at it is, uh, it's, it's a hard one to call, but you basically say x1, y1, that implies r1, theta1 in terms of polar coordinates. x2, y2, Talking about this, and this guy right here is associated with that. This guy right here is associated with that over there, and that's kind of what we're going to go for. Now, the way polar coordinates work, if they're going to call this point right here, if we're going to call it x1, y1, for example, or let's, you know, don't necessarily need to call it. I don't even put the subscripts there. Whether they're there or not, it's not, it's not the big deal. Uh, let me leave it there. Let me leave it there anyway. X1, Y1, if this has a length of R, that'd be equal to D then, I guess, right? And you said the distance is D, or at least how, how the distance from there up to there. We'll say that's R. This is theta. Theta can be written a lot of ways. You can talk about degrees. You can talk about... Uh, you can talk about radians. Radians are the most natural of all the degree measures. We'll kind of we'll kind of get into that. Um, so let's see what we can say here regarding some of this stuff. Um, if you have a, a situation like this, what what do you know? Well, drawing triangles is not a bad way to go. You go over this way, that's x one. You go up. That's y1. So what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about r squared equals x1 squared plus y1 squared. True. Uh, if you want, I mean, since we're using subscripts, that's r1, that's theta1. That's fine. You can write it like that. Not a big deal. Uh, we can also say that the cosine of theta1 is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Which means x1 can be written as multiplied by r1 on each side. We got that. Uh, opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite divided by hypotenuse is the sine. So this is stuff to keep in mind. They want now. 
uh, essentially what they're trying to go with this, they're trying to say, given the points uh, and board coordinates, you know, R1 theta 1 and R2 theta 2 and board coordinates, obtain a general formula for the distance between them. I think they want you to keep using the R1 theta 1. R1 theta 1, R2 theta 2. See, we already know the distance between them. We know this right here. This guy's going to be important. You saw me do a bunch of stuff here. Uh, you can see my blackboard space is, is not very big, and of course I write like, like, like huge. So, uh, so, we did, so we see what we got here. So we're looking at the situation uh, of, you know, we're going to start off right here. Uh, I guess the next the next time this this cuts out a little bit, right? At some point where we go, okay. So let's we'll just you see this right here. I'm gonna pick up, let me just erase some stuff right here. We're gonna start right here. We're gonna look at these identities, we're gonna look at that right there, we're gonna look at the general look of how this stuff plays out. Uh, and then we're gonna make our move on. Thank you. Okay guys, hello again. Um, Let's keep this together. I got some great people working with me and taping me here and helping me out. So I really appreciate it. And uh, they're really helping us get through this stuff. And uh, let's, you know, I, I look forward to the time where I can meet you guys in person as well when we're doing this. Hopefully, this, this crisis is over soon. The situation is this, guys. I'm going to show you to finish this thing up. We're trying to look at a formula. We're trying to look at a formula for, you know, they, they gave me two points. Um, a point R1 theta 1 and a point R2 theta 2. This guy, as I told you last time, can be associated with an X1, Y1. And this one, as I told you last time, can be associated with X2, Y2. Okay, we, we've been there, been there, kind of done that sort of thing. Uh, we've essentially said that x1 is r1 cosine theta 1 based on the mathematics we did earlier. Uh, x2, well, I mean, let's, let's do one thing at a time here, I should say. Uh, we, got, we got x1 is r1 cosine theta 1. y1 is r1 sine uh, theta 1. And this is what we're talking about regarding uh, regarding x1, x1, y1. x1, y1 is going to look like this. We'll make this a little more legible, guys. And you know, we've said some other stuff here. We said x2 is going to be r2 cosine theta 2. y2 is going to be r2 sine theta 2. We got this. And this stuff is associated with x2, y2. Okay, so we got this guy right here is all that. And this guy right here is all that. So that's essentially what we're going to, guys. We've got to talk the language that they are asking us to talk in. They want this in terms of the r's, in terms of the cosines of theta, in terms of the sines of theta. Um, not x1, y1. They want you to convert the x1, y1 into something in terms of r and theta. And that's, that's sort of what we're going in this regard. Now, like I said, some of this stuff, some of the work I'm going to do, you guys, I'm going to try to transfer it to other classes, too. If it's like a higher-level class that uses calculus, I'm likely to have calculus background or something. You don't need to know that, but some of you guys, eh, for your own personal enrichment, you might want to look at it anyway. Uh, there's a lot you can do as far as the, uh, how do you say, it? Uh, as far as some of the mathematics that's out there, you can derive a lot of the trigonometric identities. They've told us to kind of keep in mind that the cosine squared of theta in general, plus the sine squared of theta, 
is equal to 1. True. Uh, the devil's always in the detail, you guys. I mean, there's, there's other stuff that goes on. You don't need to know what I'm about to show. Those of you guys with a calculus background, or if you were to look at this from the standpoint of a class, uh, of, a, of a 209 class, of a calculus-based class, if I ever present this to you guys, maybe look at it a little bit, this is probably a good thing to look at. This is a beautiful mathematical identity. I, I is the square root of negative one. They use this thing called analytic continuation to look at stuff like this. There's some very profound and beautiful mathematics that derives this. It is not particularly very difficult, but it's very tedious. And you hear me say that a lot. In any class I ever teach, I tell my students that. It's a lot of mathematics and not really particularly difficult, but it can be really tedious. So, uh, and that's, that's the situation. So this right here helps us derive a lot of stuff. Wait a minute, this right here we got, it gave it to us. There is another identity that we can use uh, that is a little bit of a mess, but uh, we'll, we're going to actually the identity I'm going to show you, you can prove it using this, as you can prove so many things by using this. We're not going, you don't need, you don't need to go there in my 120 class. If you're a 209 person looking at this, you may, you may want to go there, you not necessarily need to go there either, to be honest with you, but uh, at this point. Uh, we've got the cosine of the quantity theta and phi, two Greek letters, plus or minus, depending on which one it is, is going to be equal to cosine theta, cosine phi, minus plus sine theta, sine phi. Quite a bit, quite a bit to say. So if you want to talk about a plus situation, if you want to talk about the plus situation, you guys, you're going to use the minus right here. If you're going to talk about the minus situation right here, you're going to use the plus right here. That's all it means when they give you something like that. Anyway, these two guys get us through this whole thing. It's a bit of a mess. I might try, I might, I might uh, cut a little bit of a corner on this one. Uh, not too much. I mean, it's, it's, it's fully solved for you in the notes. So, you know, if you, let, if you might give me a little bit of leeway when I do this, but this is something to kind of look at. All right, well, this, this is of interest. Let's see where this thing goes. I mean, it's going to be, um, I'm trying to do this the most efficient way I can for you guys. There's no, there's no very pretty way to look at it. So let me kind of, Let's, let's kind of go old school with this thing and figure out where we're going to go. Um, okay, now you remember, you got to remember, last time we spoke, we spoke along the lines of this. We spoke the lines, uh, along the lines of that you guys. So um, let's 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 convert it. Uh, D is D, that doesn't change. X2, uh, and again, this is written different ways here. I think I, but I, the way I did it in my notes, I put the X1 first. I don't, it doesn't really matter. Um, Forgive me, you guys. I mean, let me, let me just write it the way I did it in the notes a little bit. It doesn't matter. Why does it not matter, guys? I mean, I, I need everybody to kind of be aware of something that I hope, hope is pretty obvious. If I change the order of subtraction, it does matter in the sense that, hey, man, 10, 10 minus 3, 10 minus 3 is 7. 3 minus 10 is negative 7. Yeah, they're the same magnitude. If you take the absolute value of both, or if you square both, 10 minus 3 is 7. <clears throat> square 7 is 49. 3 minus 10 is negative 7. Square the quantity negative 7, you also get 49. So it doesn't really matter uh, a whole lot. Let me just say it the way I got it with the notes, you guys. Forgive me. So when you look at it, it's hopefully a little less confusing for you. 
Uh, let's put it in there, let's go. You've got this guy right here is R1 cosine theta. The other guy is R2 cosine theta 2. Born of 
of this, you guys. And then we looked at some of the, you know, the math of and you know, what is, what is X of one? It's this. What is X of two? It's this. What is Y sub one? It's this. What is Y sub two? It's that. So this beautiful mathematics tells us a lot. Gives us a chance to do the identity. A lot of identities. A myriad of identities. Okay. Uh, with that in mind, Okay, so with this right here, that way over there to the left, forgive me, uh, if you pull the R1, if you pull the R1 squared and the R1 squared, you pull them out, You've got R1 squared times the quantity cosine squared theta 1 plus sine squared theta 1. Wait a minute. Cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is 1. If you pull the R2 squared out of here, you've got cosine squared theta 2 plus sine squared theta 2. Cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is 1. When that happens, this right here, when we pull these out of there, is leaving these two to be added together. If you factor this, if you factor this out of there, this you factor this out of there, these remain in one factor, and when you sum these two, you get one. So just the R1 squared stays. Same logic right here, you guys. Here, this right here, cosine theta one, cosine theta two, sine theta one, sine theta two. Wow, looks a lot like this. There's a plus here. That plus means it must have come from a minus. Aha. Uh -huh. So, R1 squared, R2 squared, Some other stuff you got to do, 
but again, you just you just look at the algebra, the algebra skills that you do have and work with those. Okay? All right, guys, that was that's 44. Uh, so I still have time to keep going, I'm assuming a little bit little. Okay, very good. Uh, all right, guys, so for 54. Problem number 54, uh, they're saying vector, vector A vector has a magnitude of A units and makes an angle of 45 degrees to the positive x axis. B vector has a magnitude of A units and is directed along the negative x axis. Using graphical methods, find the vector sum, A vector plus B vector, and find the vector dis difference, A vector minus B vector. Okay, so they're using graphical methods. I'll, I might expand upon that a little bit when we talk about it. So, if everybody's okay with this, you know, I want to ask you guys if you have any questions, but nobody's able to ask me a question. So I'll just keep talking to myself. I know all the time. I never answer back. Uh, so what we can do is go to 54. All right, guys, 54 should go pretty, pretty quickly. A lot, a, lot, a lot more quickly than 44 did, that's for sure. Um, again, I think what we did for 44, <laughs> it's kind of like those, those athletes that do certain exercises, and the exercise itself is so comprehensive, so much of a compound exercise for allowing you guys going into physical therapy and stuff. It covers so much ground. Uh, 44 covers a lot of ground. It gives us a basis for a lot of people want to continue. All right. So they're, they're saying that you've got the A's and the B's. What's going on here? Let me just kind of draw it based on what they're doing here. Uh, and we'll, we'll kind of take it from there. Uh, so number of books on this one. There is the B vector, which goes in the negative x direction. There is the A vector, which goes in a 45 degree angle. And that's it. That's so about, you know, if this is, if this is the B vector, and that's the A vector, uh, you know, let's see what we can say here. They, they said a bunch, you know, they gave us different numbers here, uh, they both got, they both got magnitude, okay, I, I wish I would have, I should have drawn this a little bit better, um, they're both the same magnitude, so they, they may not look about the same length right now, but they are, um, something looking like that, 8 and 8 is what we got right here, this is the A vector, and the other one is saying, so they, they like to they like know if you added the two vectors, what would you get? Well, you can do the parallelogram method, uh, so It's a little it's shorter than what the other two were. This is A vector plus B vector. And that's what they're talking about there. Ironically, the subtraction is going to give you a longer vector. If this is B vector, This is A vector minus B vector. If this is B and this is A and this is 45 degrees, very strange. I think, what are you talking about? How does that even work out? Give me one second, guys. Let me get here. Okay.
does that work? Well, a vector minus b. If, if you if you subtract, you, you think how is that how is that actually doing? That? Well, a vector minus b vector is a vector minus b vector. That's plus the opposite of b vector. The opposite of b vector. If b vector goes this way, the opposite of b vector is this. That's negative b vector. This is a vector. And again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start writing on the walls is what I'm gonna start doing, but you guys see where I'm going? This is this is this is coming way out there. That's where this guy's going from. That's where it came from. So it's a bigger vector in this case. A vector minus B vector is bigger than A vector plus B vector. Now, how are you, how are you doing this? Well, there's a lot you can do here, guys, when, when you're adding these. Uh, to actually get them. So let me try to give you, let me, I'm going to refer you to my actual, I'm going to refer you to the notes that I got on Canvas. Okay, I'm going to refer you to the notes that I got on Canvas uh, so we can kind of go there. How would you actually give me the actual magnitude of what's going on? You could take essentially, there's a resultant vector. The resultant vector would be A vector plus B vector. And the way you find that is you find the resultant in the x direction. That's this, R sub x. And there's a result in the y direction, that's our sub y, and, I'll, and then this would be theta right here. And the way you would do that is you, you would sum, you would sum all the x components, all the x vectors, all the x direction vectors you, you would sum. So um, you would sum the a sub x and the b sub x, and you get the r sub x. The same thing with the R sub Y. You sum the um, A sub Y and the B sub Y and get it. Once you've got that, to get what theta is, you get the inverse tangent of the rise over the run. You get the inverse tangent of RY over RX. And that would be the theta. That's essentially the way you do it. I got this in, in, I think, pretty excruciating detail in my notes that I'm going to have on canvas for you. You're going to do the exact same argument here, but the way you're going to do it here is the Rx here is going to be the summation of, uh, you know, the, the Ax plus a negative Bx. Because I want to go in this direction. I'm doing a, I'm doing a subtraction in this direction. The Ry is going to be the summation of a y plus a negative uh, plus a negative b y, uh, in this case, how they're doing. So, uh, well, there's no real y component. There's real no y component here. But this is literally what's going on. What would the theta be in this case? The theta going on right here. This is your this is your theta. Again, you'd be going inverse tangent of Ry over Rx is going to give you the theta here, the components. Basically, this is the argument. Over here is probably a, a, a more intuitive way to look at it. It's the exact same argument every time this stuff takes place. This will give you theta. But to get theta, you got to find Rx and Ry. And to find Rx and Ry, you get this. Oh, by the way, how long is this thing? How long is it? How long Rx squared plus Ry squared, square root of the quantity, will give you R. Again, you're always playing with the Pythagorean theorem. You're always playing with the Pythagorean theorem. I will try, and I hope we're together in person. I'll, I'll talk about this. This lends itself better to something in person uh, when we're doing this. 
Uh, the notes are very, are relatively comprehensive. I think it should be in pretty decent shape. The, the, the notes are more comprehensive than what I did right here. So anyway, look at those notes and, and maybe kind of look at this a little bit as well. And I think you're going to be okay. With those four problems from topic one, I think we can give you some basis what you need to do. I want to thank you guys. Take care. Thank you for your patience.